Delightful Nightmares, Episode 2, The Last Prince, written and read by Ryan Shukas. Once upon a time, there lived a prince in a land far, far away, the only prince for many leagues, for many princes of many other kingdoms had disappeared, all destined to save the lost prince of Nastalkia. The king of queen of Nastalkia have spent two years offering anyone a fortune to rescue their daughter from Castle Bastuvia in the east. The lost princess has been trapped in their fortress for some time, being held for ransom. Seven different kingdoms have sent 14 princes altogether, only for them to never return. The kingdoms are too afraid of the power of Bastuva to search for their boys. If they laid siege, it would be an all-out war. And war is what they just resolved five years prior. Every kingdom agreed they did not want to lay siege on Bastuva for the risk of their malicious retaliation, as if that was Bastuva's plan the whole time. The kingdom of Nastakia made one last offer. The prince was from the kingdom of Tasnia, and the prince was named Avalon. A prince the king and queen of Nastakia had been watching for many seasons with Sanguine. Knowing all too well that within every tournament Tasnia won, the closer they were to making him an offer that could avoid an all-out war and save their daughter, Tanya Pinestone. They made an offer, and the king and queen spent many a night in pensive thought over the large offer Nastalkia had given them. An offer so large, they could rebuild their kingdom, expand their trade routes, boost their economy, and repair their castle from the past war. No one had ventured into the North Tower for nearly five years, from the damage it took in battle. Every day, citizens of Tasnia precociously walked around the Leaning Tower. The king and queen of Tasnia approached their son with the offer. Their boy was intelligent, strong, and erudite in combat and war tactics. Not only did he make a fierce warrior, but he would one day make a grand general or captain, if he kept striving towards his goals. The boy was naive, but knowing he would be a hero to several kingdoms, if he returned with the princess, he agreed. They notified the kingdom of Tasnia, and celebration erupted as valediction for Avalon's journey. They gifted the boy every tool, every weapon, and every piece of camping gear the kingdom of Tasnia could offer. The citizens of Tasnia didn't care so much about the princess, as the idea that Avalon would return with a girl would give the city a fortune. Turning things around since they had been derelict from the past war, Avalon took off on his journey, riding on his faithful steed Lutz. He began a journey that lasted nearly 47 days due east. Avalon was well prepared and traversed through the blue thorn pinewood forest. It surrounded their kingdom. The only way in and out was through the woods. He had to stray away from the main road and bushwhack directly east. Traveling on the main road for two hours, he yanked Lutz left onto what appeared to be a deer trail, but was in fact the route to Castle Bastuva. The moment Avalon rode on the path, he left home for the first time in his life. The forest grew dense, and the trees appeared tall and tenebrous. The way back faded away with every step they took. Finally, there was nothing left but to move forward. Slowly, Avalon traveled through the ape lands, up Ape Mountain, where 19 different clans of apes lived in the large redwood trees. Apes and man had their differences, but during the current time, they were at peace, at least with most of the ape tribes that lived on the mountain. Avalon's first night, he was invited by the Shipshara Ape Clan, Apes with purple skin and green fur. They weren't as large as most apes, but they were the kindest. It's often said that those who live in the harshest environments have the kindest of hearts, while those who live in lush environments have the darkness in them. Avalon warmed himself by the fire in a high treehouse surrounded by Shipshire apes. Their clan was dwindling because of the recent civil wars. They loved humans, mostly for their food they shared. Avalon had brought some as recompense for letting him stay. This chocolate is very good, the apes jauntily said to Avalon. Some of the best I've ever had. My kingdom has been through harsh times, but their recipes are as strong as before the war. What brings you this way? Another ape said while petting Avalon's horse. They impressed Avalon with their pulley systems. They lifted Lutz to their tree homes. They claimed the forest floor was too dangerous to sleep at night, especially because of tigers. I'm embarking on a journey many others before me have failed, where I will succeed. I journey east to the kingdom of Bastuva to rescue the lost princes of Nastakia. The apes took a deep breath as they widened their eyes, 
staring deeper into the fire. Princess Danya, Danya Pinestone, many have passed through here, many young princes like yourself, none have returned. Well, Avalon complacently scoffed, those princes weren't me. All the apes shrugged their shoulders in disdain, knowing all too well the boy was traveling to a place he would not return. My young prince, have they not told you what lies at the end of your journey? A dragon, a troll, a horde of goblins. No, no one has said anything. Do you know something I don't? No, my prince. The truth is, no one knows. No one has been there and has ever returned. Have your forebearers not told you of the stories? They've told me some. They told me there is a sickness in that black castle that causes madness. There is more than that. The ape looked at his eight brethren and sighed in disbelief, putting on a fake smile. You look more than ready to rescue Princess Pinestone. Thank you, my eight brethren. I am very grateful for you to allow me to sleep in your comely tree houses. One by one, the apes rose and exited to their hammocks, placing their heavy paws on Avalon's shoulders as they left. The last ape stayed behind for a moment. It's the twilight hour. It is time for us to rest. Much work to do tomorrow. When you wake, we'll help lower your horse, and you may continue your journey. Thank you very much. My name is Tarkov, and you are welcome in our trees anytime, my prince. Please, hear me out. Tarkov leaned in close and whispered to Avalon, turn back. Forget this whole adventure. You seek prestige, you seek validation, you seek honor. You won't find it in Bastuga. All you will find is madness and death. No one returns from Bastuga. I appreciate your concern, Avalon smirked. The king of Bastuga has never dealt with me. I'll rest here in the hammock beside me, if you don't mind. Help yourself. I'll see you in the morning, young prince. Tarkov took his leave as the young prince fell into the hammock and fell asleep to the bright yellow moon shining upon the vast forest below. Sounds of mockingjays and large cats filled the night as a warm breeze rocked Avalon back and forth. The following morning, the apes helped Avalon back down to the forest floor. They greeted him goodbye as Tarkov gave Avalon a sack full of their best food. He stared at Avalon with compunction, desiring valediction, only to realize he was too late. The boy rode off, and Tarkov knew the boy would not return. Fourteen princes had stayed with them, and Avalon made the fifteenth the last prince any kingdom will have for the next decade. Who knows, Tarkov scoffed. Maybe he will rescue Princess Pinewood. The other apes heard Tarkov and they all burst out laughing. Avalon heard the apes' laughter throughout the forest, making Lutz slightly jump. It worried him, but he carried on forward. It was nearly three weeks until he left the forest and the ape lands. Thanks to a specific scent Tarkov placed on Avalon's shoulders, the other eight tribes and most predators in the forest left him be. As he left the forest, he discovered that he and Lutz had climbed a good deal of Ape Mountain. A vast valley splayed out before him. On the other side of the valley, the land appeared denuded. The ground looked black, and upon the black land stood Bastuba. He could make out the walls and the towers from the top of Ape Mountain. They only had a few weeks ahead of them. Avalon descended Ape Mountain in just a few days, arriving at the vast prairie that stretched nearly 200 miles. Long grass that stood taller than him, but while riding Lutz, he could appear just above them. Taking his long sword, he cut down as much as possible in his path. The journey slowed until he found the trail. Lost in the grass, tigers hunted him. Lutz got scratched as one leaped through the grass past him. It moved so fast, the tiger flew. It was nearly a week before he reached the other side of the ocean of tall grass. When they did, a tiger leaped up and snatched Avalon from his horse, penning him down. It buried its fangs into his armor. Struggling to reach his dagger, Lutz came from behind and kicked the tiger in the back. The great cat yelped, releasing his grip on Avalon, vomiting a bone-chilling roar that made Avalon nearly wet himself. He slashed at the tiger's paw with his dagger. It retaliated by slicing his cheek and taking off into the tall grass. Blood trickled down Avalon's left cheek. He would live, but now had a fresh scar with a new story. Hopping back onto Lutz, he continued to the shorter grass prairie. 
Up ahead were bison so large they appeared to be two stories tall. Avalon quickly understood why the grass was so short on this side. The bison had been eating everything. The tigers ventured out towards Avalon, still hunting him. They spooked the bison, and a stampede shook the ground. Avalon kicked Lutz hard. They sped through the valley, only days away from arriving at Vestuva. The stampede cut the tigers off. They moved like a deluge. The tigers returned to the tall grass as the stampede approached Avalon. The prince peered behind him. Sweat built up on his forehead as the hair on his neck stood up. Lutz lost his footing. The ground shook so much. Up ahead, Avalon could see where the prairie ended and the ashlands began. The castle was in sight. The princess could see him racing across the valley towards the castle. The scorched dirt was full of tree corpses that appeared like frozen demons. A dusty black fog filled the air, and the gates were in plain sight. Hurry, Lutz! We're almost there! The bison were right behind them. A small few had sprinted past. The beasts surrounded them. They could topple over and crush Avalon and Lutz in one move. Reaching for his bow, he fitted an arrow and shot two of the lead bison, hitting them both right in their asses, preferably their right cheek. They both moaned and turned to the left, giving them an opening. Go, Lutz, go! Avalon kicked Lutz harder. The horse took off through the gap of the stampede. Finally, they made it through and onto the ashlands. The stampede veered left and turned away, returning to the valley. Avalon yanked on the reins and slowed Lutz down. Hey, boy, easy! You did good there. Avalon hopped off and gave Lutz some water. Patting his neck, he drank some himself. Then, turning forward, he saw it only about a mile away. Castle Bestuva. We made it, boy. We did it in less time than the council predicted. Let's make camp and rescue the princess in the morning. Lutz neighed and sat down on the ground, catching his breath. Avalon made camp beside a huge dead tree. The bark was burnt to a crisp. It looked more like a sculpture than a living thing. Avalon gathered what he could, mostly grass from the prairie, and ignited a campfire. Eating what little they had left of food, he threw down a pile of grass for Lutz, placing some apples beside his head. Well, Lutz, that's nearly it on food. We should have enough to get back to the Ape Mountain, hopefully. The princess has something. We'll need something to help us escape those tigers on the way back. Avalon touched his cheek and noticed the bleeding had finally stopped. The sun had begun to set as the light in the ashlands grew significantly dark. Their fire only lasted so long. Avalon stood up, stomped the fire out, and walked over to Lutz, grooming his neck as he saw the horse was falling asleep. All right, Lutz, I'm calling you. It's hard to believe how dark it is already. You see something, say something. But these lands are creepy enough as it is. We may be safer than we would be a mile back. So sleep well, bud. Up bright and early tomorrow. Avalon crawled into a small tent, threw his blanket over his tired body, and shut his eyes. Sleep came easily, and the morning came fast. Before he knew it, the sun was beaming through the thin tent flaps. Sweat beaded on his face as he felt like a chicken being roasted alive. Avalon crawled out of his tent. The sunlight blinded him as he coughed from a gust of dusty wind hitting his face. Wiping his face, he stood up to find Lutz drinking from a nearby stream. Despite the ashlands, the stream appeared healthy. Avalon grabbed a bucket from his belongings and walked over. Morning, old boy. Avalon patted Lutz on the back as he drank from the stream. Avalon filled his gourd while filling the bucket with water. Then, stripping off his clothes, he washed himself besides Lutz. Taking a small towel, he dried himself off and replaced his clothes and armor on, back onto his body. A small bottle of fragrance sat in his satchel. Avalon pulled it out and sprayed himself. Lutz looked perplexed. What? We've been on the road for almost two months. You gotta smell good for the princess. I don't know what these other princes did, but I plan on making a good first impression. Let's go. Avalon led Lutz back to their camp. Gathering their things, Avalon packed up his tent and fed Lutz. Then, tying the satchel back onto Lutz, he hopped on. One mile to go, buddy. Let's do some rescuing. Avalon kicked Lutz, and off they went. They rode through the black ash lands. Their hoof prints sounded like fist punches into sand. They found vestiges of the old road although large piles of ash had buried it. They arrived at the castle. Blood and ash stained the gray stone of the castle walls. The castle appeared more like a black citadel than anything else. This ash is recent, Lutz. It must have been a fire no less than a few weeks ago. This place probably looked completely different when we left home. Prepare yourself, Lutz. Avalon pulled out his eagle-shaped helmet, strapped it to his head. He fitted his shield in his left arm and unsheathed his sword. Riding forward, Avalon kicked the gate open. It swung with ease. They rode inside. 
only to find the castle was empty. There were several corpses and weapons and suits of broken armor scattered everywhere. Not one living creature lived inside the castle. Looks like a massacre, Lutz. Looks like a massacre, Lutz, Avalon said as Lutz neighed in agreement. If you see any other princes, Lutz, let me know. Their shields should have their kingdom's crest painted on them. Avalon spent nearly an hour inspecting the castle, climbing from level to level and seeing nothing. No fell beast, no dragon, or any creature responsible for the carnage. Despite all the stories he heard and what his people told him, he couldn't find a single monster. Either the beast responsible for this is asleep or has left Lutz. None of this is making any sense. I trained for years to face a foe who captured the Princess Pinestone. After almost two hours here, the only conclusion I can come to is the beast of Bastuva is dead or returned home. Avalon found the tallest tower in the Citadel. Peering at its windows, he saw candles had been lit. A smile wrapped around his face. Yanking the reins, he dismounted Lutz. All right, buddy. This is my moment. Wish me luck. Don't wander off. Shout if you see any monsters. Avalon gave Lutz a pat of valediction as he descended the stairs. Climbing the tower, Avalon gazed at how beautiful his view grew with every step he climbed. He could see across the valley and clear off to the eight mountains. Avalon was ecstatic. A euphoria flowed through his veins, giving him an extra jaunty step as he climbed the tower. Finally, he made it to the top floor, which was the ninth floor in the tower. He stood before a large wooden door with splatters of red paint covering its surface. It wasn't a perfect paint job. Whoever painted the door gave up halfway. Uh, uh princess? Avalon knocked on the door and paused with consternation. Then, putting on his best hero voice, he waited for a response. It is I, Avalon, from the kingdom of Tasnia. I am here to rescue you. Have no fear, your hero is here. Avalon opened the door to a horrible, odiferous scent that filled his nose. Avalon audibly gagged. Vomit filled his esophagus as he took a moment to gather himself. Standing in the doorway, he looked around the tower room to find bones everywhere. Skulls lined the windows. Each bone of each skeleton appeared separated and organized into specific piles. A pile of flesh sat in the corner. Flies buzzed around it as Avalon now understood where the smell was coming from. Stepping in a little further, he found a pile of armor, gloves, boots, helmets, and shields to his right. Looking down at the metal shields, he recognized the princes who never returned. Fear grew in Avalon's eyes as the hair on his neck stood up. Avalon turned his face forward. There was a large bed where a creature emerged. They wielded a large axe in their arms. Blood stained their hands that appeared to Avalon like eagle claws. They stepped forward with a large mane of blonde hair obscuring their face. The few glimpses of their face frightened him. Dark black rings obscured her eyes, which were luminescent blue. In the shadow of her hair, her bright blue eyes shined like lasers. Blood stained her mouth as she smiled with missing teeth. The teeth that remained were sharp like a predator's fangs. They moved forward, standing in a ripped nightgown covered in stains. Avalon lowered his sword, incredulous at what he was seeing. The closer she moved, the stronger her scent became. Uh, uh, Princess Tanya? Were Avalon's last words. The axe she held flew like a hawk and embedded into Avalon's skull, straight through his eagle-shaped helmet. The boy prince fell backwards with a loud metallic clunk. The creature that was once Princess Tanya Finestone dragged Avalon's body into her chambers, shutting the door behind her. The End